we came little by little seeing similarities in many things. Actually, I, I have to admit that um, when I read some of the books concerning the similarity, I think it's exaggerated a little bit too much to say that uh, uh, Japanese magatama is yod in Hebrew. Uh, it, it's stretching it a little bit too far. Um, to say that uh, the, the six, 16th petal uh, chrysanthemum is the same as uh, in the temple in Jerusalem and, and the same as uh, in Japan. Uh, so it has the same meaning. It, it, this 16 petal chrysanthemum can be found in Maya also, uh, in, in Central America, Maya. Um, it, it's, the similarity is there, it's true. There is some sort of connection, a definite connection. But to say everything is similar, I think is exaggerating a little bit too much. This is my, as an archeologist, this is my, my personal opinion. Uh, there is a definite connection. It came in waves of connection uh, during the Tempio era in Nara, when the Silk Road was uh, flourishing. That caravans came from the Middle East and traveled to China, to Chuan, Chang'e, and came to capital in Nara and they brought with them Roman glass. And they found Roman glass. I know there's many, many uh, remnants of Roman glass in Israel now. You can find it in, in, in many shops there. But to find it in Japan, to find it in uh, tumulus in Korea, this is uh, proof that it was brought. That weavers, glass makers, builders came along the Silk Road, and most of them, many of them were, were Hebrew and Jewish. And they found a place to live in Nara, they found a place to work there, they found uh, a new livelihood there. The connection is very definite, very definite. And uh, it starts in Nara and, and then continues until Japan closed itself off in the Heian period when uh, there was no more connection to the uh, continent. But uh, it was stopped until the 17th century or the 18th century until uh, traders came in from Nagasaki or, uh, and uh, then it started all over again. But uh, I, I saw it in little bits and pieces all along the way. Uh, and this, this looks familiar. This is kind of interesting. Um, that's when I first became aware of it. Yeah. This uh, Hatla clan, they themselves said that they were descendants of the first emperor of Qin. The emperor that unified China. Uh, China comes from Qin, which is the, the name of the dynasty that they made. And this emperor of Qin was uh, something of a despot, you might say. He was a, uh, a dictator, but he unified a warring country. He unified the language, he unified the money system, he unified the weights and measures system. He did burn books and he did oppose scholars because they were uh, already kind of rotted, you might say. I'm not defending the slaughters that he did, but the Emperor of Qin was a necessary in Chinese history. And uh, the Qin dynasty is in Western China, which is very close to uh, Central Asia. And it is said that the Emperor of Qin, the first Emperor of Qin's father was Jewish. And uh, the Hatta clan comes, is, uses the same Chinese character for Qin. And they say that they were descendants of this Qin dynasty. 
So uh, with his father being Hebrew and the clan traveling further eastward uh, over centuries to Japan is, is not something very strange. Um, if glass was found in Japan, then of course people had to bring the glass. And uh, it was, it was uh, in, uh, well, first there might have been a wave of it, but then there was a general migration. There were people traveling back and forth all the time. So I think that uh, this Hata clan, they traveled from China, from Western China, through uh, along the Silk Road to, uh, it wasn't Chowan yet, it was uh, uh, a different capital. And uh, they traveled through Korea and they spent a long time in Korea. And then they came into Japan. And of course, uh, Korea at the time was also warring. First of all, I think they were very literate. They, can, uh, they knew many languages. They knew the languages of the lands they passed through. Uh, they could live there. They were craftsmen. They were very respected by the other people around them. They were the builders. They built uh, bridges. They built uh, irrigation systems. Of course, they knew about irrigation systems from the uh, Central Asia. Uh, and uh, they were able to build it here and the weaving, the silk weaving, the brocade weaving, uh, this is all, this is all brought in, yes. Uh, yeah. Hata also means loom, so it uh, it's a, has a double meaning. But uh, yes, they brought the, the silk, the weaving techniques over, and uh, glass making especially. That was a, uh, a Jewish monopoly almost. And they did it in Nara. Yes. Yeah. There was a, uh, even now, there's, there was a, a Persian quarter, a Central Asian quarter, just uh, north of uh, the central part of Nara. And uh, they lived there. This, uh, so um, there, there was one big wave, perhaps. But then, uh, because of this relation, this trading going on, I think it, it was constant, almost. Yeah, as long as people traveled from the continent to Japan and from Japan to the continent, I think there was a lot of going on between people. And they brought this Messiah cult with them. Of course, uh, almost, even if you're not religious, almost every Jew believes that uh, the Moshiach will, will be coming. And uh, that's the common denominator, I think. It's this uh, hope that uh, something better will come. And this has kept the Jewish people alive, I think, and going through the Holocaust and through the pogroms and uh, through everything. Uh, it might be terrible now, but it'll be better. And this Messiah cult was brought along the Silk Road and I think it actually influenced the uh, Indian cult in Maitreya, in the uh, Messiah to come. Goju Roku Oku Nana Senman Saki. It's a long time Saki. This Maitreya, this Miroku, this Bosats will come. And it's exactly it's the Messiah. It will make a better world. Uh, that was brought all through Asia and into Korea. And Korea had a very unique system where they say, we're not just going to wait for the Messiah to come. We're going to make this earth, this kingdom, this Silla, this Shiragi. We're going to make our kingdom ready for the Messiah to come. We're going to set up uh, a, a good system where everyone is happy so that the Messiah could come easier. And they set up a very interesting social system in Korea. And this was brought into Japan. Uh, so uh, that's another link with this Messiah cult, this, this belief that something better will be coming. It's unique. It's unique. Of course, uh, in Western Europe, they believe the Messiah has already come. 
but uh, everyone else from, from Israel eastward is still waiting, which is uh, another link. Uh, things are not over yet here. It's, it's still moving. Uh, in Europe, it's already done. But here, it will be getting better. And uh, that's another interesting point, I think. The names have changed. There, uh, there is people that still go by the name of Hata. Uh, but the uh, Japanese system is that uh, you take the name of the place where you live in. And so it's uh, Hata from this place, Hata from that place. And so the names changed uh, to Kamo. They changed to uh, this and that. And it, they took the names of the places where they live, and so uh, the names might be changed, but uh, somewhere, somewhere there's a memory in the, in the cells of the body, I think. Yeah. yeah. Of course, uh, in history, the Hatha clan stands out, but uh, there are, I think there, there are many uh, individuals who have come here and, and uh, over over three, four centuries I think there must be you know, a very very deep connection somewhere. You know. mm. Well, as I think I'm sure you know that Osake actually means David. Uh, it's the, uh, the Chinese character for David and uh, uh, the head of the Hata clan, Hata no Kawakats, was exiled, or he, he self-exiled himself from Kyoto, from, from Asuka, from Kyoto, to Sagoshi. He, he couldn't be there anymore. Um, his patron had died, uh, Umayato no Miko, uh, Shotoku Taishi, died. And uh, the new political atmosphere was very hostile to him. And so he self-exiled himself there, and he died there. But uh, yes, this Osake, this, this uh, shrine to David, was established where he, uh, his boat landed. Yes, yes. He was uh, at least the renowned head. He had brothers, and one brother went to Wakayama, and uh, another went to, uh, was it the Ise no Ho, and uh, one was uh, uh, concerned with martial arts, and another was concerned with literature, and the Hata clan was divided between, but this uh, Kawakats was the uh, advisor to Umayato, who established, you might say, the, the spiritual establisher of Japan. and. Uh, the whole cult is based now on Umayato or Shoto Kutaishi. He, was, he became a, a cult figure, that uh, the patron of Buddhism, but he wasn't really, you might say, he, I, I don't know how much Buddhist he was. I think he was Nestorian Christian or very close to Judaism. Uh, the things he wrote, what he believed in, um, what he was aiming for was uh, this establishment of a Messiah on earth. He was very devoted to that, actually. This uh, Hata no Kawagats was his advisor, his teacher, and uh, his uh, finance minister, uh, his uh, foreign minister. Uh, he was a very important figure. Yeah. In every other religion, there is a head who is the authority. You know, there's the Pope in Rome, there's the uh, Church of England, the uh, uh, um, Canterbury, the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury. There's always someone who is the authority. But in Judaism, there's none. It's a religion where we agree to disagree. And there's no one that says that they have a monopoly on the teaching. It's the way that you interpret it the way that you want to interpret it. And uh, perhaps this is the thing also that has kept it pliable and uh, 
when it's pliable, it's alive. It's like uh, in Tao Te Ching, in Lao Tzu, in the uh, Taoism. Lao Tzu says that uh, because the teeth are hard and rigid, they disappear first. But the tongue is soft, and so it lasts until you die. And perhaps in Judaism, there's this pliability also. And this is what has kept it alive. As a student of history, I've seen that the Jewish God, how it evolved, where it evolved from. If it evolved from the area of Ur in Iraq, and uh, it takes on the form of Baal, and it takes on the form of the other gods there. And it evolved into something that is a common denominator for a lot of the tribes there that they can agree on. But after that, no one agrees on anything. And uh, that's the interesting part of it, maybe. Um, I know that uh, ultra-Orthodox people would look at me, especially, and say, oh, this is not Jewish at all. And, and uh, there's a lot of uh, discrepancy in that. I know that. But uh, the, the tradition, uh, when you hear a certain melody, when you hear a certain uh, kind of note, when uh, it comes to a certain ceremony, uh, the, the Purim and, and the Hamantashen comes out, and, and that, that is religion. You know, it's, it's what is in daily life. It, it, it's, you can have religion as a philosophy, but then any philosophy is equal. You can believe in anything. It's from here up. Human's head from here up can, can imagine anything. It doesn't really matter. It's what's here down. And for someone like you who have done karate, you know that as much as your, your spirit is strong, <clears throat> it is also physical. You have to make it real. And to deny from here down is, uh, it will not get anywhere. It's, it's only going bad. So any philosophy, any religion is from here up, but it's the way that it's embodied, the way that it's lived, the way that it's uh, uh, enlivened, from here down that makes it a living religion. And being able to be Chinese Jew or Indian Jew or Japanese Jew, it, it proves that, that from here down is pliability. And that is what has kept it alive in places that other religions can't go. Other religions say that, especially Christianity, that uh, the bodily, the physical thing is already a sin. Being born is a sin. If that is, there's no place to begin then. Is there anything you do then is wrong. It's not. And in Japan, in the Orient, the body is not a sin. And in that way, uh, the Jewish religion is very oriental. Very oriental. And I think it, uh, it could flourish in the Orient better than it can flourish perhaps in France or in England in that way because it's more pliable. Yeah. They have no knowledge of Judaism, and so they can't compare it. Um, they only know the tradition, the, the ceremonies that they've been taught. Um, if they knew the history behind it, if they, they knew Judaism, I think that maybe they would start thinking about it. But um, they don't, it, it's a matter of scholasticism. It's uh, whether they know about it or not, that's all. There are many, many ceremonies that are similar. Um, they say that Moses' haka is in Aomori. Uh, they also say that Jesus' is haka is in Aomori. They say that the Ark of the Convenant is in Tsurugisa, in Shikoku. Um, there, there's always been a a wanting to be connected to something older, to something uh, stronger, you might say. I don't know if this is in all Shinto. Um, Shinto is actually very local. Uh, there was, it was 
only a very local earth-related, nature-related religion. And this was all unified forcefully 150 years ago under the Meiji government, which needed something to face up to the Western religion. They needed a unified religion somehow, something that uh, vilified them as being a modern government. And they looked at uh, France and they looked at England and they said, oh look, they have a, a one God, they have a, a king who represents God on earth and we need it here too. So we can't have all these little shrines all over. We can't have all these little ceremonies all over. We have to unite it. And the emperor has to be the center, has to be the king, has to be a god on earth, just like uh, Napoleon, just like uh, the Queen of England. And so they, they forced these natural religions. They forced perhaps the link between uh, Judaism and Japan, they forced it to disappear. I have friends who do gagaku, the uh, classical court music. And during the Meiji era, many, 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 almost two thirds of the compositions were thrown out because they had no meaning to the central government. But they did have in the old tradition, they had it because it related to kingdoms that no longer exist. Bokkai koku. Bokkai koku, it has its own uh, uh, dance. It has its own music. Bokkai koku doesn't exist anymore. It's a, a kingdom that disappeared in the 12th century. But the music exists. The Meiji government ruined so much, it made the emperor into a god. It made the central government more important than the local government. It forced Japan to commit mass slaughter in Manchuria and then considered it to be a civilized nation. And this is the, this is the beginning of the downfall of uh, Japanese culture, I feel. It led to uh, World War II, it led to the invasion of Asia, it led to the mistake that Japan made during the war. But uh, it, it was only because it wanted to become so desperately a modern country. They had to model the West. And they had to model it on religion also. And so Shinto was cut away. The good parts of it was cut away. It was forced to unite it, to unify it, to unite. And this is a cultural, cultural genocide, I feel. And uh, so many of the links, I think, were lost there. There weren't that many books about it. And it's not taught. I think it's some sort of innate feeling. Uh, they want to be. They, they, they heard about it somewhere and they're happy to be part of it. They want to be part of it. Of course, now, now uh, there is this very strange conspiracy theory going on. This, uh, there has always been a conspiracy theory going on that uh, the Jews are behind everything evil. Uh, that is nothing new to any Jewish person. But it's getting very strong now because the internet could, uh, anyone could press a button and spread it out through the world. And so what used to be only among fanatics in uh, Tsarist Russia or uh, before Nazi Germany, um, uh, now with one button goes out throughout the whole world. Uh, so this conspiracy theory now is getting more violent, more virulent, 
more spread out. And this, I feel, is very dangerous because all these people that talk about this conspiracy, they have never met a Jewish person. They don't know that there are poor Jews. They think that everyone is, is money mad, everyone is rich, and everyone is controlling it. I'd like to know a Jew who's controlling it because I don't know any. But the truth is hard to know. They don't want to know. But as this conspiracy has been going on, uh, not in Japan so, so for so long because uh, it was kind of left out of things for a long time. Only recently, very recently. But this feeling of wanting to belong to Judaism, this feeling of connection to Judaism, perhaps uh, somewhere they've heard about the Holocaust, perhaps they've heard about these people who are oppressed, and it's something the Japanese have a, uh, a feeling called Hogan Biki. Hogan Biki was uh, uh, that your compassion goes out to the underdog. It starts with Yoshitsune. Yoshitsune was a tragic hero uh, of the 13th century. Uh, he has become the epitome of uh, pathicism. Uh, he, he's to be pitied, to be honored, and to be pitied. And to go out to the underdog, this, this hero that is forced to die, uh, the Japanese feel very close to that. They like these stories. Uh, Chushin Gora is best, be, based on that. Um, these heroes that, at the end, they will commit suicide, ritual suicide. They have to, because it is the law. But it's only after they do their duty. So uh, the Jews, the history has been similar to that. You've had the Masada, you've had uh, the Holocaust, you've had the pogroms, you've had the uh, uh, persecution. And the Japanese have learned about this recently and I think they feel connected to it. They want to be part of it, actually. Uh, and the more they know about the tradition, they hear the music or they see something, I think they'd be very touched with it because it's a very warm religion. It's like I said, it's not from here up, it's from here down. And it's something they can relate to. It's not the... Uh, difficult Gnostic theology. It's something that you sit there, you eat, you break bread with them, you know, and uh, it, it's something living, something viable, and I think that's what they feel comfortable with. Perhaps. Yeah. What do we know about the Yamabushi? Ah, this is interesting. That's interesting. Yes, I was sort of surprised to see. Uh, Tengu wearing Zvilin. And uh, I says, we, this is, uh, I've never seen this anywhere. It does not exist in India. Uh, they paint things in India, but they don't have Zvilin. They don't go on the mountain and wait for visions there. And uh, when, I, when I saw Yamabushi, when I saw them wanting to be Tengu, I, I tried to research that and found out that, yes, it goes back to the Hatta clan again, that um, uh, the Hatta clan was forced to go into the mountains when uh, things became kind of hot, when the, the political situation changed. They were forced to go into northern Kyoto, and they became Tengu. And the, the tradition, I think, has been given down this idea of uh, uh, philosophy, uh, mountain philosophy, and uh, martial arts, and uh, this, this pliable way of living, this uh, closeness to, how shall I say, wanting to become one with something that's uh, ungraspable. And uh, this is uh, Yamabushi cult. And yes, it goes back to the Hatta clan, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a recent uh, program on television that, uh, as you know, this, uh, in Iwate Prefecture, there was no coronavirus until very recently, and there's only 
two people there that were infected. And uh, why in this prefecture only there is very little infection there? And some person is it, it, really going off. It's uh, one of these uh, crazy ideas. But um, there are six very important shrines in Iwate. And if you connect them, it makes the star shape. And they say that this uh, star power has kept Iwate safe from the coronavirus. I, I, where, where do you draw the line between religion and, and history is very sometimes very difficult. Um, uh, every year, the students apply for entrance exams to university. And they put their entrance exams in the post box. And they do this to the post box. And they, 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 they expect the, some sort of divine intervention to go with their application and they will get into the university. And so where do you put in Japan this, this uh, line is very difficult. Uh, the belief here is very, very interesting. They, they found a, a cult in uh, Wakayama Prefecture about 20 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, the police broke into this strange cult there and they found a statue of uh, Mary and uh, a statue of Kanon Sama, you know, the, the, the Bodhisattva of uh, compassion, and also Shonben Kozo, this, this uh, uh, Belgian uh, boy peeing off a. They, they, they were believing in all three statues there. So, where do you draw the line in? Uh, Japanese religion is very difficult to get. Uh, that's what's one good thing about it, is this pliability. One family can be, you can have uh, grandparents who'd be Buddhist, the, the parents would be almost n no religion at all, and the children could be Christian and celebrate Christmas and Halloween and whatnot. And there is no arguments within the family. Uh, religion is not that important here. It's everyone is celebrating. Everyone is Shinto during New Year's. Everyone is Buddhist during Obon. Uh, funerals are Buddhist. Weddings are Shinto, and sometimes they're Christian. And it doesn't make a difference. So that's the wonderful thing about things here. Um, the, the Meiji government tried to crush it, but couldn't. And uh, I'm glad it's alive here. In Japan, they have the best of all possible worlds. It's, uh, they, they choose from, uh, from this and that. If it fits, you wear it. And uh, it's, it's a good policy. You might say that they have no policy there. Uh, uh, there's no one belief. Because they're comparing it to Christianity. They're comparing it to uh, England or France. Or, but no, it's what? is alive, is moving, it's changing. And that's what Japan has. It's not stagnant. And I hope it doesn't become stagnant. It, it, the Japanese really do not know their history as much as other people know their history. I mean, you can go to any school child in England, or they know their history tremendously, uh, who's who and what's what. I'm amazed at the ignorance uh, even of recent history, there's no interest in it or it's not taught. It's, it is even, I think, discouraged in a way. And this is, uh, this is not a good thing. But uh, do you know that the imperial family makes a sukkah, a sukkah every year? Um, every year, uh, uh, when they bring in the new crops, when the, uh, the rice is done and, and the, the vegetables come in, they, they, have a, uh, they make a temporary dwelling and they give a ceremony, a ceremony in there. So um, it, uh, it, little bits and pieces all over, it's very similar. But uh, when it comes to the imperial family, there's a, a complete shutout. You cannot excavate uh, graves that might be related to the imperial family. So you really don't know what's what. Uh, who's where, where's the connection, it's, it's all stopped there.
And this only happened during, after Meiji. Before that, it was kind of, it was loose. Um, the emperors were very poor. They uh, sat outside the palace uh, reading, doing calligraphy and selling their calligraphy. That's how poor they were. And uh, it didn't matter who was the emperor anymore. Uh, there was a, a shogun, there was a, someone else ruling the country. So you had a, a political wing and a religious wing. And uh, the religion, of course, here is pliable, and it was always pliable. And so uh, the emperor did his own thing, and uh, he was somewhere. But as long as the society was uh, straight and continuing, there was no worry about it. And so the Japanese have become very complacent about their religion. They don't have to know about it. They don't really want to know about it. They don't want to know about their history. And so it, uh, it's very hard to dig things out. Why do you believe in this? Why do you do this ceremony? Why do you, do you purify yourself like this? Why do you believe in it? And they can't give you an answer because they don't know. They don't know. They haven't studied it. There's, it, there's no reason to know. It's there. It's OK. You know? One thing that I, I really am fascinated in is this idea of uh, uh, Toko waka, this idea of renewal. You go to Israel and or Egypt, and like you said on the telephone, everything is made of stone, and it lasts. It's, it lasts, or uh, you go to Iraq and you find uh, 5,000 years. You go to India, you can find uh, Mohenjo-daro. You can find uh, that's going back 6,000 years. You can you can go Egypt and. It's in stone, but uh, because of the weather here, everything rots and things are made out of wood. Because of the uh, rain and the good forest, Japan has made everything of wood. And because it's made of wood, it has to be renewed. But not only that, spiritually it has to be renewed. Other things, they are happy. Oh, Oh, I, my, I like antiques. Uh, this antique is uh, 300 years old. This goes back to the Italian Renaissance. So everyone is, is uh, they're boasting of how old it is. But in Japan, they say how new it is. Of course, Horyuji is the oldest wooden structure in the world. But that is kind of besides the point. It's, uh, it, it doesn't have to be old. It just is old. They don't, they don't keep it old. It just lasted because the craftsmen there knew what they were building. When Japanese carpenters cut a tree and they stand it up, they make sure that the north side of the tree stays on the north side and that the directions, the, the tree stands in the same direction that it stood in the forest because that's the way it grew, and that's the way it'll last. So they take advantage of the natural elements as it is. But the natural elements, everything rots. It, 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 uh, it, things change, things die. And so it has to be renewed. The spirit must be renewed. The Shinto priest, when he does harai, he takes away the impurities, the way you know, from a mirror, you clean a mirror off and then you can finally see what you look like. The spirit also has to be cleaned. Tokowaka, always new, always, always young. And this is a very important idea in Japan, something which I think is unique. I've never seen it anywhere else. Everyone else says how wonderful it is to be older, to have this, uh, their, their antique collection. This temple is 3,500 years old, looks sort of. Uh, but in Japan, 20 years old, even the grand shrine of, of Issei, every 20 years is renewed. It has to be renewed. To do this toko waka, we must be renewed also. Your own spirit, your own heart. What do you do then? 
you don't need a ceremony. You go out into the forest. This is why the Japanese do、uh, hanami. This is why they do momiji gari, to, to go out and look at the autumn things. It's to renew your spirit because only the natural world can renew a spirit. The idea of building a garden, a niwa, the Japanese have excelled in building gardens. It's so that you don't have to go far into the mountain. You can go right one step down from your house, and there you can have the spiritual world there. You can be renewed right in your own house. So, this idea of constantly being renewed, constantly being purified, is very, very important in Japan. And this is what I find、uh, wonderful. The trouble is, is in Japan there are a lot of、uh, yuko fads. Every year or so there's a new fad. Something new comes in, everyone does it, everyone sees it, everyone eats it.、Uh, the Beaujolais Nouveau. At first, when it came to Japan, there were lines of people trying to get this、uh, new French wine every year. A fad died out. A fad in, in small dogs. That fad died out.、Uh, kocha kinoko. I don't know if you remember that.、Uh, you leave tea rot. You, you take the、um, decay from a tea and you somehow boil it in something else and you drink it and it was supposed to be good for your health. That fad died out. Everything in Japan has a fad. Every year something new comes. They make it part of them. Nata de cocoa,、uh, tapioca.、Uh, it's, some, it's something new. And, Uh, it becomes part of the culture for one year, and one year and a half at most, and then fades out. And then comes in, something else comes in. So if Judaism came into Japan, it stayed as a, perhaps as a fad, or it became part of the culture so much that you can't separate it anymore. You can't find it anymore. You can't, can't pick it up and say, oh, this is this and that's that. It,、uh, it became like, like tapioca, you know? It, 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 it will stay in the culture, although it might not be the main thing, it might not be as big a fad as it was, but it will stay. And that's what Japan is. Everything comes here and stays. It's the end of the line. The end of the line for the Silk Road, the end of the line for a lot of、uh, philosophies, theologies,、uh, craftsmanship, everything has stayed here. Uh, Japan is the end of the line. Yeah. yeah. The last station on the line. Yeah.